Welcome to the Scorpio New Moon webinar, continuing the series of cyclic meetings where we get together around the New Moon to meditatively support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Every month we focus on one goal, match, matching it to astrological energies of a uh, sign through which the sun travels at that month and use this astrological potencies to strengthen our meditation. Today we focus on the goal number 14, life under water. And our speaker today, our focalizer, is Sharon Deep. Um, thank you, Sharon, for uh, stepping in uh, to this responsibility and please share with us your thoughts and lead us in meditation. Okay, well, thanks, Alexander. And thanks um, for creating this space for us uh, to gather like this and strengthening the work of, of the United Nations and being able to visualize together what our better world would look like. And a warm welcome to all those that are on the line, um, willing to contribute a bit of time and energy, focus good thought to support the UN development goals within the energies of a Scorpio new moon which occurred yesterday morning. Uh, the specific development goal, Alexander, that you uh, asked us to focus on today is, as you said, goal number 14, life under water, which is rather appropriate uh, for Scorpio energies. Scorpio being a water sign and Scorpio energies incline us to dig into what has been hidden and bring it into the light of day, fertile for new growth fertile for ways to reorient ourselves, our ways, our means, doing things. And today we have a Scorpio sun and a Sagittarius moon. And Mars relates the energies between Scorpio and Sagittarius. Mars is a common planetary ruler of both signs. And two of the planetary rulers of Scorpio Mars and Pluto happen to be an exact aspect today. And it's easy to imagine that they are coloring the quality of our work together. Mars determined action is considered to be the personality ruler of Scorpio. And in the sky above Mars is in Libra, determined action. Mars gives us the tests, testing us toward balancing the scales of our relationships, up, down, all around, and within. I guess we can include life below water as well. And Pluto, transformation, regeneration, welcoming, no compromise, as we may know in our life, if we've had Pluto transits, Pluto welcomes no compromise. We can kind of hear Pluto telling us, do it or else. It's considered to be the sole ruler of Scorpio. And in the sky above today, Pluto is in Capricorn, a transformation of outer structures. So today, Mars is challenging Pluto. And it's as if we can hear them telling us, change your ways and means, take determined action to balance the scales of your relationships, including life underwater. Reorient yourself or else. While Mercury being the spiritual ruler of Scorpio is in Sagittarius, purposeful and focused thought and is harmonizing with Mars and Libra, purposeful and focused thought as to how to take determined action to balance the scales of our relationships. 
purposeful and focused thought as to how to support the UN development goals, specifically for us during this meeting, life underwater. So in looking up today at the astrological energies, it is as if we are aligned um, pretty well with the energies available to us by being here on the webinar, using our focused thought in this way and working in this way together in support of the 2025 initiative, preparing the way, affords us the opportunity to transfer whatever anxiety we may be experiencing about the world occurrences to active preparation for the externalization. We, in effect, then perhaps have the opportunity to identify ourselves <clears throat> as among those Scorpio warriors who from the battle emerged triumphant. Doug Hamishol, the second secretary general of the UN, indirectly referred to his faith in Scorpio warriors when he commented, he said, I cannot belong to or join those who believe in our movement toward catastrophe. I believe in growth, a growth in which we have a responsibility to add our few fractions of an inch. This is not the facile faith of generations before us who thought that everything was arranged for the best in the best of worlds. It is in a sense a much harder belief, the belief and faith that the future will be all right because there will always be enough people to fight for a decent future. That's what he said. He believed and he had faith in the Scorpio warrior. He believed and he had faith that there would always be enough Scorpio warriors. So let us now, for just a brief time, allow ourselves the opportunity to simply savor the presence of those on the line with us today. Let's scroll down the list of attendees, sending each and every one a line of living, loving, light substance, as we also, at the same time, uh, keep our identity as a living soul, as Alexander aligned us earlier. We also want to call in those who wanted to be here and couldn't make it. Unfortunately, there's conflicting webinars, but there are Many of our coworkers said that they are linking up with us, um, and so we'll call them in as well. And let us align ourselves with the stated objective, beautifully stated, stated objective of the 2025 initiative and in attempting to express conditions connected with the soul whose essential nature is light. And may the light between us and among us and within us continue to aid us in unearthing each little new bit of the path before us, the tests, the trials, warriors we are, and from the battle we emerge triumphant, preparing the way. Scorpio is considered to be the light of day. This is the place where three lights meet, the light of form, the light of the soul, and the light of life itself. They meet, they blend, and they rise. Using our creative imaginations, we can visualize the light within each of us, meeting between us, blending, and rising. Each of our little lights can spark new light, and each little light stays lit within the radiance of the greater light. And let us realize always that by our own individual presence within a group such as this, each of us invokes into the consciousness of the group information and instruction, and therefore a certain area of wisdom which would not otherwise find its way into the group. Thus in our own way, we each make a contribution simply through our presence. It's an invocative force 
adding to the wisdom of the group. And for this, we are grateful. Let us dream no dream nor think no thought that could harm a brother or sister on the path and thereby dim their light. Let us see all world servers in the light and be willing to walk the path with them, to enter the battle with them. Let us say no word that might direct the thought of others toward being of harm. And let us shield our coworkers, our brothers and sisters from every harmful word. Let us hear the note struck by our coworkers, our brothers and sisters. And within the note, the very same note being struck by them. Let us blend our own. So in effect, there is a purposeful blending and fusing of all our brothers and sisters on the path, a strengthening of hands. We are one with all of our brothers and sisters and all that we have is theirs. May the love that is in our soul pour forth to them. May the strength that is in us lift and aid. And may the thoughts which our soul creates reach and encourage. And let us carry these thoughts forward from the rapidly forming group of all world servers. Our family of world servers is growing, mating and blending and fusing together. The light is bright and let our light rise in alignment with the great ones who look over and guide our planetary evolution. Behind the warriors, between the light and dark, blazes the light of the hierarchy. Let us work together toward an inner subjective focusing of the light within subtle realms to strengthen the thought form of solution in supporting the development goal for life underwater. And let us do this in the face of and in spite of exoteric functioning using our creative imaginations. Let us visualize ourselves resting together as if gathered at the water's edge, the dark potent regenerative waters of Scorpio, perhaps aligned within the periphery of the great ashram. Let us recognize our place as a group within the heart center of all world servers. And let us see a line of lighted energy extending towards Shambhala, granting us the strength of purpose to be together now, comfortably discussing and freely sharing thoughts pertaining to the development goals, working toward our better world. And at this point, let me share that um, I, there's a, a couple of coworkers on the line at, as panelists um, who have agreed uh, to be what Alexander has termed uh, co-discussants with me um, to help uh, uh, explain goal number 14. Uh, we've got Martha Gallahue and Iris Spellings. And um, yeah, and Martha and Iris and I work closely together at the UN. And um, together today, uh, we're going to do a little bit of an experiment. We're going to try to attempt to translate the language of the goal number 14. Uh, it's like the UN has its own language, the UNEs that's used uh, into words that we can more readily hold closer to heart. And by doing so, the idea is that we might be able to more readily add to the thought form of solution, strengthening our purpose as a group in mediating the plan into existence. A few weeks ago at the UN, we tried doing this while working in meditation at the UN 
an event that the spiritual caucus at the UN held during the week of spirituality, a small group of us went through each goal, each of the development goals, and worked together in putting it into our own words as if we were in an elevator and someone we were riding in the elevator with asked us, what is that goal number, whatever? And we wanted to answer, making a connection, making it a little more real uh, before the door opened. And uh, we were then to be out and about. So <clears throat> let's give this a go. Um, so development goal number 14 is to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. So it's to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. And we'll say it one more time to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. So how could we put that in our own words? What would we say before the elevator door opens? Um, I guess we could say that um, we don't wanna pollute the water. Um, we could say that water is life. Uh, we could say that um, we need water to sustain life on the planet. Um, Iris and Martha. <laughs> <laughs> jump, in, jump in here anytime you'd like. Yes, Sharon. Yes, we're here. We're here. <laughs> Iris, Iris, would you like to offer a response? Well, I would like to um, put forward the scope of uh, what we're talking about. Um, we live on an ocean planet, and three quarters of the Earth's surface is covered by oceans. And it says containing, I'm, I'm reading from uh, one of the Gaia education, uh, they have flashcards on each of the SDGs with certain facts and questions of how we might be able to uh, come to some solutions. But um, it says the oceans contain 97% contain of the water and providing 99% of the living space by volume. So it's massive. And uh, over 3 billion people's livelihoods are directly, directly depend on marine and coastal biodiversity. And also, the other thing that's really important is the oceans play a critical role in the global temperature and atmospheric regulation. The oceans make the earth habitable for humanity and the rest of life. And by 2014, only 8.4% of the marine environment under national jurisdiction was under protection. While there has been a slow rise, though, from 15 to 19% in the proportion of Marie Key biodiversity areas under protection worldwide. So the coral reefs are very important. And I know there's been much more awareness. They've been able to, there was a program I saw, I think, on National Geographic about photographing the coral reefs. And, and, by photographing the coral reefs, they were able to uh, find out, uh, much to their dismay, how quickly, how rapidly all of this is, is happening, uh, that we're destroying the coral reefs. And the good thing about that, though, is that that brings the awareness so that we can change. And so now I believe there is more and more protection 
uh, for marine life as a result. So I'll just stop here. And Martha, if you have anything you want to add. Thank you so much. I would like to bring together, first of all, the meditation that uh, Sharon launched made me think about the importance of the word emergence. And the oceans, as we know, actually are the places where the deepest areas of life exist, that in some places we have between three to 500,000 feet of depth. And from that very space of darkness, much new life gets generated. So I'm thinking as Iris indicated the maximum nature of this particular space that 193 countries agreed to conserve and to sustainably use. We have the very important earthly etheric space where life in some ways is generated into new forms that we can barely even dream of. And if we thought about this motivation about conserving, we tend to think of conserving as protecting, but I'm actually thinking of it in terms of gestation. Uh, when a child is conceived or, and new life is conceived, a plant is sown in the soil, there's a space of darkness and depth. And if we thought of our opportunity to be responsible for that, I think we can find our motivation for the importance of this particular goal. The second thought that I had, and again, this notion of water is life, and Iris's point about three billion people actually depend upon its life-giving resources. If we thought in terms of, first of all, our own bodies, as above, so below, as we know, perhaps we could begin to think of the ocean as that portion of the earth where, as one, it constitutes the majority of what life is about, just as our bodies uh, sustain, contain most fluid. So sometimes when I'm thinking about the ocean and I'm thinking about my relationship with it, I think of it as the lifeblood or the medium through which information about the tectonic plates, about the power of volcanoes, about the uh, need for uh, not intruding upon its life forces through sonar um, mechanisms and technologies. That we, we think in a protective way and we also think of the, the mystical, the miracle sense of generating life itself from the waters. Uh, we know those who were evolutionary biologists could say it in a much better way, but that we suspect that all life uh, in form emerged from the oceans. And so it's unthinkable that we wouldn't seek to conserve it. The other notion about the sustainable use of it is that as we increase our numbers in human form, it brings to mind what right relationship is. And we can think about right relationship in terms of the reciprocity that as water has given us life, 
and we in turn give water service, we think about sustainable use not only in terms of consumption, but in terms of relationship and understanding responsibility and what that looks like. So just as we till the soil, we, we have the opportunity to sensitize our own consciences as to how we would care for that. So there are, it's, it, it may be helpful to look around at what is being done in our various areas. I know we're an international group and I know that each of us knows something about our locality. So forgive me, all I can do is to uh, hold up a small exercise in one of our localities. I come from New York City. There is off the coast of a small island part of New York City called City Island, a river called Hutchinson River, where there's a project uh, that's been going on for eight years. Um, that would be six years before the uh, Sustainable Development Goals were founded, where the community has gotten together for an annual cleanup of a mile and a half of the shore along the Hutchinson River. Now, in the process of that, the peoples brought together have to figure out how to get there. They have to figure out how they're going to not use plastic to gather their bottles and debris and and what they're going to do with it, how they're going to turn it into recycling. So it brings to mind the the importance of human cooperation in not only the restoration of this planet, but the acknowledgement that we have an opportunity to be in new relationship with life on the planet. So there's a marvelous paradox about this particular goal, which is that most of the volume of water and the oceans and the rivers and the tributaries and all of, of life underneath is unseen. We cannot see most of what it is we're trying, trying to protect. I, I would suggest what an opportunity for us as we connect to this particular goal to think about the power of human intuition that is more and more in every day in so many small instances to see ourselves as interconnected with all life, to see that the inner workings of our own body are exactly the workings of the planet, exactly the workings of the cosmos. So I'm deeply appreciative of you, Sharon, for starting out with the astrological significance of this day, in this moment, with us together, talking about Sustainable Development Goal 14, conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Martha. Iris, that was beautiful. You know, the, while listening to you, Martha, it brought the thought to mind that um, given that this is Scorpio, you know, digging deep when you said that it's, the waters are dark and going into it. And, and I was struck by the fact that I had really no idea um, until working with the UN on this goal that that um, plastic, our use of plastic is such a uh, such a problem. And, and so that we, um, you know, so we dig in not knowing what we're going to find and all of this plastic comes up and then and then that's fertile for new growth it's fertile for us to reorient our ways and to say oh wait why am i using all of that plastic and it just seems like such a scorpio 
a, a little a little tincture of what Scorpio energies is all about. And I think I was I think I was with you, but didn't the UN have an exhibit that had all of it was like a plastic island or something that they used all of the plastics and they made a do you remember that exhibit? Can't say I do. <laughs> Sorry, but no. you probably are right. <laughs> yeah, it was by the cafeteria upstairs by the cafeteria and they had they were showing us the amount of plastic that's under the water and at, if you uh, were to bring it up what the uh -huh. land mass would be and it was like extraordinary it was the size of rhode island sharon yeah, <laughs> yeah you remember it yeah thank yeah. you martha well, it was I, the size of rhode island. i know it from this from the work of the uh, agencies the legal department at the un that is working to negotiate intergovernmental um problems with regard to the oceans and that in, if I can take a minute to just yeah, add to yeah. this challenge of the plastic, since Mars is challenging Pluto, right. that the, <laughs> the, the challenge with plastics is, is that there are new technologies that are breaking down the plastics into very, very small components. And so that particular fact about how much uh, is being fed into the oceans daily. Um, there is a response to that as well, which is uh, bringing them down into um, breaking down the plastic into microbial parts, however, size parts. However, because of the nature of plastic, it cannot actually be transformed into something that, if we think alchemically, can, can change. And so they're saying that the chemical components of plastic, no matter how small it's broken down, it, the fish um, feeding on it in, as it's ingested in these small parts, it still comes back to the other living organisms through the human, through our excretion, excretions that the a cycle of plastics is is uh, in opposition to mm. what we consider organic life so that mm. the notion of conscience this notion of responsibility while we appreciate the technologies that are coming to play they were never meant to justify the continued use of plastic oh, that's interesting yeah martha so we, oh mm -hmm. sorry yeah go, go ahead. ahead sharon no 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 that's okay go ahead well you bring to mind um when you talk about plastics and the micro particles that uh mm -hmm. that get into the ocean and in into the food chain and into us. Um, I last week the UN had a program called Fashion and Sustainability: Look Good, Feel Good, Do Good, using fashion as a vehicle for change. And one of the things that they said was that uh, polyester in clothing, uh, the polyester, every time it's washed, those particles come out into the water and i think you mentioned martha that it, washing in cold water is better is that right that it it then warmer water with polyester that there's yes, less of but, that yes but it doesn't justify the continued right. manufacture of that iris right and just while i'm talking about this uh briefing there was another fact that um really took me back and and it was the fact that making a cotton t-shirt takes 913 gallons of water and that 913 gallons of water is enough drinking water for 900 days for one person oh. and if you think about 
water, I just found out last spring that water is finite. I never thought about that. And, and of course, we, we have water. The earth is abundant in water. But, but the amount of drinking water, I mean, we have 95% of, of, of it is ocean. Only 2.5% of that is fresh water. And of that 2.5%, 70% of that is ice. Well, maybe less now. And 30% yeah. is groundwater. Only 30% is groundwater that we can access. And less than, so less than 1% is fresh water. And of that fresh water, 70% is used for irrigation and 22% is for industry. So that mm -hmm. leaves 0.08% for domestic use. So that's why it is so very important that we save water. And when we're saving water, we're saving it also for people around the world. I just found that just to be a astounding uh, it really is facts. Mm -hmm. And, and Iris, that that point also illustrates the basis for the fracking argument that we're concerned deeply about fracking because of the chemicals that are used, but it's also groundwater that is being mm -hmm. used to raise a, a, an energy source that we don't need anymore. So this mm -hmm. goal, right. goal fourteen also illustrates the interrelationship of all 17 of these goals and how grounded the when we talk about the incoming ray seven energy how grounded it all is in terms of our taking part in the issues of the day and to what might drive our awareness in terms of the choices that we make. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, last last year, World Water Day, the theme of it was why waste water? And it focused on reducing and reusing water because water efficiency and learning to reuse the wastewater is crucial uh, to preserve the water supply for future generations. And as we know, it's much less expensive to keep the planet clean than to remediate pollution. And the, the, and the opportunities of using wastewater as a resource are enormous. So uh, more of that, I think, we'll, we'll see will start coming out. And it's something for us to think about and do um, ourselves in our own homes. Yeah, that's what I think is, for me, it really hits home that so often um, the mentality of, of uh, the masses of humanity or we the peoples is that the UN is going to do things for us. And now we see with the sustainable development goals that the UN is really, the way I, I look at it in my mind's eye is kind of like they're the kitchen table, you know, and, and they're able to raise awareness uh, like they, in June, they had the Ocean Conference, and it was basically to just raise awareness of the threats of the of the world's oceans and how it is really affecting people's lives. But nothing can the UN these goals cannot be achieved unless we the peoples really do these, which seems like very small things, but they um, they need to be done in a way that is connected to the to the whole. I read where um, I think we were talking about it the other day is that that um, once uh, humanity is able to uh, make that leap in, in consciousness to be able to see the to go from the me to the we that the sustainable development goals would be much more easily achieved. Um, and I guess the UN, just by the fact that we have the UN, the only manifestation of brotherly love that we have on the planet, should really give us a lot, or it gives me a lot of hope um, 
because it's something that anchors that level of consciousness that we each need to have. I also wanted to mention um, real quickly that the UN Climate uh, Change Conference just ended yesterday in Bonn, Germany. And I thought it was interesting that the um, Fiji uh, shared it. And so, and Fiji is so vulnerable, you know, it's, it has 1 million people and it has 300 islands and they're at the front lines of, of um, definitely countering climate change. Um, and the president of, uh, or the prime minister of Fiji uh, was saying that unless the world acts decisively to begin addressing the greatest challenges of our age, then the Pacific, as we know it, is doomed. And um, when I read that, I was thinking, well, unless we do that, then you know we're, we'll all be doomed. But um, I thought it was wonderful that that he was the one that was uh, presiding over this. I'm sure he had a full heart when he was doing this. I also saw on the internet that um, that you can actually uh, rent a space in an underwater hotel in Fiji. I don't know mm -hmm. if anybody mm -hmm. else knew this, but I thought this was <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. yeah, and it's fifteen thousand dollars a week per person to be in an underwater hotel in Fiji. And I was thinking, gee, how entrepreneurial of Fiji, you know, that and then <laughs> I know that some of the plastic bottles, the, the water, uh, it's Fiji water, you know, so they're right. And yeah, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. uh, let me see. I also wanted to um, definitely mention that the climate finance is critical, you know, that where's the money coming from for these kinds of things and, and going through the uh, on the website uh, preparing for today, I see that there's a lot of really good things that are going on around the world. And Martha, as you said, you know, we can speak only for our own neighborhood or community, uh, but then at the same time in consciousness, we know that we're, we're working with people, men and women of goodwill or all world servers uh, from around the planet. I see that there's different universities that are divesting um, big investors like Microsoft and Bank of America are introducing green bonds and they're supposed to have a triple A rating and and it's all about bringing in the new. Um, let me see and it seems as though uh, right now uh, and we kind of see the shades of this, I think, at the UN, that the jury is still out as to if we, the people, are going to rise to the occasion or if the corporate and the moneyed interests are going to step in to this very powerful partnering role that they're being invited into. Um, you know, the very entrepreneurial. So it's, you know, it's definitely something that we can hold in the light um, that it brings to mind, Sharon. Yeah, that it brings to mind that we are in such an age of transition, and that our choices are so important. It really matters that we don't buy water in plastic bottles. It's a right. small, thing, but we've all grown up on this thought that the flutter of a butterfly wings makes a difference in yeah. the future of this planet and it's never it's never more obvious than this particular goal about our great oceans and the and how it breaks down into the small smallest parts as iris said 0.08 percent yeah. how precious how very precious water is and yeah. what you're saying, it's really important um, not to underestimate the little bit that we do uh, because it can also be an example uh, to our family, our friends, and people around us. And, and that's 
that's what really needs to happen is that more and more people need to know about this. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I mean, they know we have a problem, but uh, they, the, who can grasp the scope? And here are some, I know there's, I don't know whether, maybe you know for sure whether there's, there's been a proposed decade for ocean science for sustainable development from 2021 to 2030. I don't know whether that's gone through or not. Do you know that, um, Martha? I don't, or I don't think it's been decided, but it's a very, very strong advocacy. Wanted to explain also that the, calendar events at the UN where is it decade is it a decade uh, Sharon uh, Iris from 2021 to 2030 when that happens there's yes. a particular focus there's a particular it? focus <laughs> and for those who are interested in religion we're finding that there is a new liturgy that's coming around uh, just as these sustainable goals might be seen as the new Ten Commandments. It had, there's a universality to this, and that this is how um, the on the level of the third, fourth dimension, that, that humans become more conscious. It's so practical. Mm -hmm. There, um, there, on this site, uh, UNESCO site, about the proposed decade. Were you finished, Martha? I'm sorry. Martha? I was. Yes, I am finished. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, on this site, there are seven facts, I thought, ocean facts and knowledge gaps, it says, about the ocean. Um, and I thought, if it's okay, I'd read them very quickly. Um, sure. Yeah, it's great. Um, Thank you. But, yes. Basic biodiversity knowledge is non-existent for 99% of habitants of habitable marine areas. Up to 1 million marine species could still be unknown to science. Only 5% of the ocean has been mapped and less than 0.05% of the ocean floor has been mapped at high resolution. Science cannot yet reliably measure the cumulative impacts of climate change, marine pollution, and biodiversity on the global ocean, and biodiversity loss on the global ocean. 276 million square kilometers of, quote, deep sea, end quote, exists in perpetual darkness, like you were saying, Martha. Only 3%, I'm sorry, only three humans have explored the deepest known point of the ocean. Mm. And lastly, there is no internationally agreed mythology methodology for estimating the value of the ocean and the services it provides. That one probably touched me the most. <laughs> yeah. And I Did think you say, it again? Actually, say it again. Yeah, just there, one is, more time. there is no internationally agreed methodology for estimating the value of the ocean and the services it provides. Um, not that we need that, but I just found mm. it, it interesting. Mm. I'll pick I, up I, on that point, Iris, simply mm -hmm. to say, just in one sentence, we are getting to the place where we're realizing the limits of our material measurement of economics. Exactly. So obvious when we talk about the value of the oceans. Thank you so much for bringing up that point. Yeah. Yeah, that should really be like the theme. It's, it sound, it's so profound, you know. Uh, Sharon, um, we are getting uh, close to the end of oh. the time, the time okay. that we um, usually have this webinar. Um, <coughs> um, we can extend it a little bit, uh, but would you like to... Um, I see. This is from two to three, is it? Okay. Yes. 
Oh, I didn't know. I thought it was from two to three thirty. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, well, thank we can you, Iris and Marcia. a little bit, but yeah, maybe we can. Okay. We'll hmm? we'll wrap this part up, right? But but just let me um, share that there's a lot of really good things that are going on in the world. And let me see. Some place here I have. Uh, it's called store storify dot com. S T O R I F Y dot com. And it's just inspiring stories of action all around the world. And for people that are working in their communities or groups, it's I find it very helpful to to show people what is being done someplace else and then we we try to uh, replicate it somehow or modify it as opposed to trying to come up with something totally new. Um, let me see. And then I also wanted to just quickly say uh, that the UN is encouraging us not to, oh, if you want to go to that other slide, Alexander, that the UN is encouraging us not to get stuck into what they're calling issue silos, but to move toward uh, paying attention to the interconnection between the goals. So taking more of a whole system approach. And uh, this, this chart here kind of reminds me of a bit of a divine circulatory flow of energies. You know, Martha spoke to it also that, that this goal that we're working on is, is kind of on the, the bottom or the biosphere, along with the mineral, the plant, uh, the animal kingdom. And then we have the goals associated with society, either the human kingdom. And then we move up to the uh, spiritual asset of money, uh, which leads us to forming partnerships and co-creating, which we could uh, call the kingdom of souls and and beyond. So in this chart that uh, they have, they're calling it the wedding cake. But when I saw it, I kind of thought, that it was a divine circulatory flow of energy. So you could kind of see a cross really with the, with the social uh, band being the horizontal arm of the cross. And, um, and I, I like to think that they've got uh, goal number 16 being peace in with the social. And I was thinking that it would be really nice to see peace as the, as the, in the center of that cross. Um, let me see. I also wanted to say, if anyone is interested, that's on the line and working in their own groups or anything, I, I want to really encourage you to look up uh, GaiaEducation.org. G-A-I-A Education.org. They're offering some very useful tools to those interested in training, and they call it Train the Trainer. And they're looking forward to trainers being multiplied all over the world because we really need a lot of communities um, being activated and having the awareness built. Um, so through the impression and expression of all these certain great ideas, humanity must be brought to the understanding of the fundamental ideals which will govern the new age. This, we are told, is the major task of all world servers. So not that we have time for a lot of meditation, um, but let us quickly use our creative imaginations to visualize the energies and forces pouring upon our solar system and our planetary lives ceaselessly, potently, and cyclically. Scorpio, we are told, is the great constellation which influences the turning point, both in the life of humanity and the life of the individual human being. For the first time in history of both mankind and disciples, the energy of Sirius, that great star of sensitivity, the source of constant and perpetual flowing of love that strengthens the link between humanity and all spiritual and cosmic lives, is now evoking a response. And that's from Esoteric Astrology, kind of, on page 198. So <clears throat> how should we do this, Alexander? Uh, should we just have a minute of silence? 
I think we can go with the meditation that you prepared as the meditation is the main part of our work. So. I okay. Think we well, so then I would like to hold just a, a couple of minutes of silence and reflect a bit uh, on our seating that we've done up to this point and holding the development goals for our better world in the light of mind as our one soul quietly sounds the keynote of Scorpio to us, warrior I am, and from the battle, I emerge triumphant. Warrior I am, and from the battle, I emerge triumphant. Warrior I am, and from the battle, I emerge triumphant. So having gathered all that we have from standing within the light of Scorpio, let us be grateful, giving special thanks to the Lords of Sirius for streaming essential love through Scorpio into our planet. Let us realize that this cosmic love to be an ever-present permeation of all planes and states of planetary consciousness. And let us see this energy electrifying, strengthening and deepening the link between humanity and all spiritual and cosmic lives. Let us visualize the precipitation of the will to good, essential love, throughout the planet, becoming anchored on Earth and prepared physical plane centers through which the plan can manifest. Let us keep in mind the many ways in which the power of the one life and the love of the one soul are working out in the world through members of the new group of world servers. So building the thought form of solution to world problems. And let us consider the redemption of 
humanity through the right use of money. Taking just a minute to visualize the money in the world today as concretized energy. You can visualize money as a great stream of flowing golden substance passing through, passing out of the control of the forces of materialism and into the control of the forces of light. Let us sound the great invocation together in distribution of all that we've gathered together. And as it's distributed, pouring out throughout the planet, irradiating and infusing the consciousness of the whole human race with light and love and the strength of purpose. from the point of light within the mind of God. Let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men. The purpose which the masters know and serve from the center, which we call the race of men. Let the plan of love and light work out and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power Restore the plan on earth.
you very much, everyone, for participating in this work today. Thank you, Sharon. It was wonderful sharing and meditation. Thank you, Iris, Marta. Thank you, Alexander. So thank we've... you, Alex. And, th and thanks. And yes, thanks, Alex. And thanks to those that are on the line. If if you think if people wanted to stay, if they had questions or anything to ask us, they could. We would be willing to stay on, or how would you want to do that? Yes, absolutely. If anyone has anything to share, you're welcome. We'll just, we could stay a little bit longer. Um, absolutely. Um, I will read uh, a comment that um, Rebecca shared. Thank you so much. Wonderful discussion and meditation. I feel so inspired and fortified. That's wonderful. Thank you. You probably noticed that we uh, continuously experiment with different formats of our work. And uh, today we tried the new form uh, for our work. And uh, from now on, uh, we uh, plan to work with this format. And we have a team of presenters who agreed to be uh, focalizers for our webinars. And I'm really grateful uh, for you, Sharon, for you, Marta, uh, and everyone who joined this team. So in the next months, we will uh, have different people leading this work. And uh, I encourage everyone who participates in these webinars to take more active uh, participation. And we will uh, try to have um, more time allocated for sharing from the audience. Uh, as we see it as a process of collective weaving of the group meditative focus preparing to the meditation and meditation as a main part of our work. There is a comment from Annette. I saw the diagram with the circle as Maslow's uh, Maslow pyramid. Thank you, Annette. Yeah, that's actually really wonderful diagram. And I was really inspired seeing that. Thank you, Sharon, for bringing that forward. Uh, I didn't see it before. And I think it's a wonderful representation of the goals, of the levels of the goals. And what you said, it really inspired me because it really brings the idea of the level of mutable cross, then fixed cross and cardinal cross. And there are eight goals on the fixed level. It's very related to the reality, I think, of where we live now. I also want to use this chance and to remind about uh, the reflective process that we invited our audience to join while we're in a cycle of Scorpio and uh, to m meditate together with the initiatives coordination group on the uh, ways to improve our work of the uh, of the 2025 initiative. And so uh, on the screen, you see the questions that we asked you to reflect on. And so if you could share with us your impressions, uh, comment on this meditative process, please submit us. Uh, share your impressions via email or uh, the form uh, that you see in the chat window. Uh, by mistake, I sent it too early during the webinar, but I will resend it right now. And uh, so if you could, 
follow that link and sh submit your impressions to us, we would really appreciate that. And I, uh, Rebecca, did you raise your hand before? If you did, can you please raise it again? Yes. Morning, Rebecca. Rebecca, you unmuted, so if you would like to share anything, you're welcome. Now? Yeah. Yes, now we can yeah. hear you. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I had my speakers plugged in. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much it, to everyone. It's just wonderful to um, have the, the goals developed in, in this multifaceted way with the discussion. It's really great. Um, finding it, I found it very inspiring. Um, I was interested, there was a couple of things that came to mind um, when the discussion about the, the limited supply of water and the reuse of um, water and everything and the huge, well, I'll come to that in a second, but um, that really reminded me of this great circulation that happens on our planet of which the ocean is such a a big part of you know the the transpiration and the evaporation and the circulation of the water through rain and moisture and humidity and um, the the way the um, water is filtered through the earth and then runs down to the sea and just I'm um, also wondering about the idea of the significance of the difference between fresh and salt water and, and what it could mean that the sea is salt. <laughs> um, so I don't have any answers to any of those things. It was just that idea of that huge circulation and purification process that happens um, with our water, so that um, we can we can think of water as being a finite resource, but it's so living. Um, I don't know if water gets created in that great process, but certainly. Um, lots of stuff happens to it um, that we probably don't think about a lot of the time. Um, and the other thing that I um, am really interested in the comment was um, about this idea that every little thing that we do helps to create um, a different consciousness and um, hopefully bring about the change but in the the incredible potency of industry and the economy you know in the wedding cake model it's actually the economics is actually hovering up there quite high in that um in the power that it has in that diagram and um just sort of thinking about um, you know, even the statistics about how much water is used by industry compared to how much water is used um, by us in our in our households, and um, just really, um, there's almost an adversarial um, sort of feeling between industry and the people sometimes when you when you look at these um, these issues and just wondering how can that. Um, be bridged, you know, because there there are wonderful technologies that are being developed and that exist. And I'm thinking about the grander water technology that has been used in industry, but you know, on all levels, we've got the technology to be um, doing things in much less destructive ways. How do we get across that gap so that industry is actually reflecting this? And you know, there's there's a lot of um, research that's been done on the consumers having opinions and attitudes say not to use plastic bags but then their behavior doesn't match that so um, there's such an important role too in what's available that people will use you know um, yeah it's a real conundrum that um, I spend a lot of time thinking about <laughs> so that's all Sharon and Alex Martha could, could I 
respond to Rebecca? Absolutely. Yeah, please. Um, Rebecca, thank you so much for giving us feedback on what you said. And I think the heart of the issue is how do we bridge the gap between the resources that industry has and the will to good that um, is we're being all called to right now. I'm, I'm going to hold up the last thing that Sharon said, which is historify.com, that so much good can happen when we tell the good story. For example, mm -hmm. there is um, a lot of technological work, as you said, going on in Florida. It is to convert salt water to fresh water and what that takes and how much we're learning from that, how expensive it is and so on and so forth. But still, we're exploring the possibility. And then the other thing is to maybe let go of our assumptions about the good guys and the bad guys, because mm. I've learned in working at the UN that so often countries that have very problematic behavior in one area or another do so much good on, mm. you know, in another area. For example, I'm not necessarily indicating well well let me just say that israel's violated uh, international law at the uh, 23 times and yet it has the model for reclaiming fresh water and they have worked so diligently and proven that mm. there are, are reclaiming sources they are uh, you probably heard about it reclaiming the negev desert and it was mm. a, desert not only uh, devoid of life but it was considered to be on the border of non-reclamation there are certain areas that they're saying scientists are saying they can never be reclaimed and then the Negev was on that list of going that way and, and then what they have found using very minimal amounts of water but very carefully distributed ways of of bringing back that desert. So my mm. point is, let's look to the stories that are working and mm. get rid of our silo issues. I think Sharon said it that way. I also support what you said about the wedding cake image. That's a permanent picture. I don't know where it came from, but what a valuable, valuable um, meditation image. Thank you. May I? Is there time to say a few more words? This is Iris. Yes, Iris, of course. Thank you, Martha. Thank you. And thank you, Rebecca, for uh, your comments. And uh, it's so interesting about uh, the big difference between salt and pure water. And if anyone wants the information about water content that I gave, I found it from a site called bluelivingideas.com b l u e l i v i n g i d e a s.com and you're right about the um, economic impact because just at this briefing it was amazing that the fashion industry is a 3.3 trillion dollar industry and I see that uh, it's similar to the oceans as well. The oceans and coastal resources provide approximately three trillion in value from to the global economy. So we're talking big numbers. And and the other thing at the briefing was interesting because, like Martha said, instead of thinking about the bad guys, uh, it's often people aren't aware but when people are aware they're they are happy to change and so that was something that there are some organizations that are popping up like uh in the fashion industry one called canopy style initiative and um they are kind of a go-between between industry and uh the suppliers and the producers of clothing. 
So they're finding out, like they, for example, did a research on uh, newspapers. Why, you know, we got rid of newspapers four years ago. Why are the companies, the paper mills still running? And come to find out it's producing pulp from trees for clothing. So the whole idea is to try to switch now to more sustainable products um, that can be used in industry instead of these. And those are like the tree pulp ones are viscose and rayon, um, so things like that. But the woman was very quick to say, it. we're not saying don't buy these things yet, which it may give us pause and we may not want to buy these things, but they're not putting out a don't buy list. They're saying we're seeing change in the industry. So there's, it's wonderful, the attitude, I think, um, where, mm -hmm giving room for change. And there's another group called NEST, and then at the UN, the UN Global Compact, which is the world's largest corporate sustainability initiative. So things are being done. Mm. Thank you. I, uh, thanks, Rebecca. You know, um, you had expressed an interest um, earlier and um, about training the trainers. And, and so mm. I want to encourage you to uh, look up uh, GaiaEducation.org, G-A-I-A Education.org. And that's where I got the, um, the wedding cake uh, graphic from. So they have uh, an assortment of, of training guides that allows us to, to look at the sustainable development goals in, in different ways. And so this uh, chart was actually done by the Stockholm Resilience Center. And um, it's to encourage people to look at the sustainable development goals as a whole systems approach. Mm, great, thank you so much. I, I tried to Google guyeducation.org. It didn't uh, come up. Maybe there's some spelling mistake that I, I did. I've got it now because I didn't. I I um, googled it with a spelling mistake, so I've got it on my screen now. So don't worry, I'll be looking it up. <laughs> Very. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, for this wonderful work and uh, we definitely will continue this rhythm and uh, image came uh, to me at the beginning of this uh, webinar that the rhythmical work of meditation at some point starts to support itself and it's like heart pumping blood so it pumps itself in a way so this rhythm will continue and um, Thank you for joining and please join our next uh, webinar. It will be Solar Festival uh, webinar uh, on December 1st uh, with the Michael and Tuya Robbins. Uh, and they will share with us on a topic, building group in Takarana. And that would be Sagittarius. Thank you. And let's stay connected. Yeah. Thank you. Blessings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.